listen now to scripture as I read it to you from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. For once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first biblical text that I memorized was Psalm 23. Psalm 23 was the first text I completely memorized. And almost everyone knows it. It's the most requested scripture at times of funerals. Why? Because it captures the realism of life and also the hope that we know in our faith. Life as we have said repeatedly in the first part of the service, is filled with blessings. It is filled with good things, just like this day is a blessing. Life is replete with moments of joy, times of celebration, times of happiness. Indeed, okay. with the psalmist, I believe we can proclaim that, our, that in our lives, our cup overflows with the goodness of God. And each of us should meditate upon that, how indeed our cup overflows with God's love and God's goodness. But we also know this, life is characterized too by dark moments, by sadness, doubt, and fear. The brightest day, and it's a bright one today, also casts long shadows. And they often blanket our lives like a pall. Light and shadows. Today I want to examine the tension between the two because they exist together in our lives. First, by looking a little bit closer at Psalm 23. I want to also look at this well-known psalm in terms of our contemporary life. And finally, I want to juxtapose it with a New Testament text from the letter of Ephesians, that text I just read to you. Psalm 23 is a metaphor, a metaphor that the people of the Mideast would understand. You see, the God of the Bible is one who is unknowable, a God who is vast, powerful, and wholly other, one whom generations have understood, even to this day, in terms of metaphor. And so we use words like father, king, fortress, true vine, defender, to describe and to state who God is. But in Psalm 23, we hear God as a shepherd. A rural agrarian culture like the Middle East would understand this metaphor with all its complexity. And thus Psalm 23 was a rich expression of the goodness and presence of God. The psalm is first reflected on the wonderful gifts that God gives to each of us. God is such a caring shepherd that none of us want for anything. And incidentally, when we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it doesn't mean that we don't want God in our lives. It means that we have everything we need. We want for nothing. A little translation there green pastures, we have food, we have bells, we have still water, our thirst is quenched, we're restored when we're weak, the good shepherd knows the way through the tangles of life and leads us down those paths. These are the awesome blessings of life, but as I mentioned, the psalmist is also realistic. Life is not always 
a bowl of cherries. And I should have corrected that when I wrote this. A bowl of strawberries. <laughs> there are valleys of shadows in all of our lives. There are times when we find ourselves in difficult situations. There are times when we are depressed or filled with sorrow. It might be the moment of grief, having lost a loved one, or the grief that accompanies change. It may be a physical condition that causes pain. It may be the loss of a job or a broken relationship. These are real moments in our lives. And they touch all of our lives in some way or another. There are moments when we are left with loose ends. There are moments when we shake our fist at the heavens and we say, why? These are the times when we are face to face with our own finiteness, indeed our own mortality. The psalmist acknowledged the reality of these moments in spite of life's rich blessings. The Hebrew people, you see, believed that there actually existed a valley of death. And they called that valley Gehana. This was the valley of the shadow, a place where one could literally experience, feel the reality of evil. This was the valley of the shadow of which the psalmist wrote. Now their sheep are not aggressive animals. And because they were sheep, they were often preyed upon by other beasts. They were very vulnerable. And there were times when a shepherd would have to move the sheep from one grazing area to another. This might involve going through an area, or a valley if you will, where predators would lay in wait. The shepherd's rod and his staff would protect the sheep as they journeyed through that valley. The rod was used to fight off predators. The staff brought the wandering sheep back to the fold. And so the words, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, means that we experience the protection of the divine, even during moments when we are afraid, moments when we are in the valley of the shadow. The Hebrew people knew this valley. They knew it well. It was the place of despair. It was a place where good does not seem to triumph. It was all the places in life where justice seems absent and fairness non-existent. I think there's a valley of the shadow that all of us experience at one time or another. The psalmist assures us that even there, even there, we are not alone. God is with us. I remember the moment that this psalm came alive for me. I said it was something I memorized early in Sunday school, but it was just memory. But it came alive in my own life, much as I'm sure it has come alive in your life at some time or another. It was early in my ministry. And without going into too much detail, it was not a very good time. Now here's what the studies indicate. Nearly 50% of all clergy will leave the ministry within the first five years. They will drop out and pursue another vocation. And I was there. I was there. You see, we graduate from seminary filled with high expectations and visions. We believe that we will preach and people will want to hear what we have to say. And not only that, we'll do the good that we proclaim. We have envision, we envision of our congregations swelling with people hungry for the good news and the message of hope that we can bring. The call to ministry is like falling in love. It really is. And like all lovers, there comes a moment when you wake up and wonder, what have you gotten yourself into? <laughs> and I was there. Ministry is not an easy calling. And I was just discovering this reality and was in pain and tremendous doubt. 
doubt, a valley of the shadow. I've never been a very good letter writer, but I phoned my father and I shared my tales of woe and despair with him, you know, kind of, you know, dump on dad day. And in retrospect, I know that that must have caused him a great deal of pain to also hear that from me, just as I have gone through that pain as a father of a youngster. I remember very little of the content of that call. I wasn't listening, I was mostly talking. But about a week later, I received a letter from him, and in it he delivered some of the most sage advice that a father could give an adult child. He wrote about this psalm, Psalm 23, and he stated two things, both emphasizing the prepositions through and with. Through and with. First, he said, we go through the valley. And second, he said, God is with us. The valley of the shadow, the times of pain and sorrow and depression are finite. There is a beginning to them and there is an end to them. And like a geographical valley, we go through them. We do not have to be stuck there. And he reminded me of that. What a wonderful thing to hear when you think you're stuck. One goes through those valleys. The experience of the valley of the shadow is real for us, but in the midst of the darkness of that valley, we need to remember that there's an end to it and that we go through it. We are journeying through the valley, not stuck in it. And the second one is with. God is uniquely with us in those times. I think that's probably the hardest thing for us to realize and to know because it is during those moments when God seems so far away. It's precisely at those times when God seems most absent in our lives. We feel abandoned. We feel alone. And the psalmist affirms those feelings. But then he states the reality that we are not alone. God is indeed with us. Perhaps so near that we can't see him, that our eyes will not focus on him. The loneliness of the valley of the shadow is real. I and you are intimate with loneliness. But I also know that one of the gifts of God is the transforming power that takes that loneliness that we feel and is able to create solitude, which is time alone with God. And that is refreshing, as refreshing as still water, time with God. You know, there's a corporate dimension to the Valley of the Shadow also. I love Abraham Lincoln. And I am moved by the power of his leadership. Scholarship has suggested that Lincoln possessed a melancholy personality and might have been given to lengthy periods of depression. I doubt if we would elect him these days. He was the president of our country when we as a nation were in the valley of the shadow, literally. We were fighting with each other. We were killing one another with both sides invoking God and justice. Both sides believed they were right. Both sides believed that they had God on their side. A national valley of death and destruction. In his second inaugural address, Lincoln articulated perhaps on the basis of his own intimacy with sorrow and melancholy, the presence of God in this struggle and his hope for the nation in the midst of the, this dark historic valley of a civil war. His words are almost sacred, and they should be part of our national canon. The letter to the Ephesians does not speak of valleys of shadows, no. It speaks of light, and that's where I want to end, talking about light and life. Because that, too, is a reality that we need to remember. It alludes to Jesus' words, you are the light of the world. It reminds us that in the midst of darkness and shadows, our own and others, 
We are called to bring light, the light of hope, and the light of life to others. I know that my father's letter fulfilled that for me. That was 37 years ago, and it's just as if I received it yesterday. He brought light and hope and life to me. I believe Lincoln was able to do this for our nation during its darkest period. And my prayer is that your future pastor will be able to do that for this congregation. But more, enable Poland Presbyterian Church, all of you, to be a light for this community. All of you to be a light for this community. Let us be realistic, however. The future is not completely rosy. As the psalmist says, there will be darkness, there will be shadows, there will be pain, and there will be sorrow. There will be moments of doubt and times when our souls are wounded. And yet in those dark times, the light of life, the light of Christ can shine. God is indeed present, and we go through those times. The word is through, not in, and they are only temporary. There have been those lights of life in your life, but also in mine. We are challenged to be those same lights to others and to the world amidst the valleys and the shadows. This is good news, but also a charge. Believe it, live it, and do it. Amen.